So welcome all and uh, welcome to this presentation on the formation of the Isthmus of Panama and why this is important to understand what are the possible links between the formation of the Isthmus and the modern world as we know it today. I'm uh, Dr. David Books. I'm a senior lecturer in geology at Cardiff University. I'm going to uh, present a fairly non-technical account of what we know about the formation of the isthmus. I'm going to explain a little bit what is the ongoing controversy about the exact timing of the isthmus and more importantly I'm going to explain why understanding when the isthmus of Panama is formed is important for a range of reasons. So uh, this is obviously a uh, a presentation that is uh, using a very large range of data and results which have been collected in collaboration with uh, many different people. I've put down here on the screen a few um, logos outlining some of our main collaborators. Uh, I'm apologizing for all the people that I couldn't include here on this slide. There's been a lot of uh, very active collaborators in the past few years in this project. So I thought that perhaps a good starting question to talk about the formation of the isthmus would be to uh, ask ourselves, what is exactly the isthmus of Panama? So here we've got a nice view of, of the Earth. It's from Google Earth, where you can see North America, South America, and the isthmus of Panama is one part of Central America right here. It's more, more or less actually from a geological point of view, it's, it's included in these uh, rectangle here in, in white. And also uh, what is actually important to realize on that image is that Panama is not only forming a land bridge between North and South America, but it is also forming an ocean barrier between the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. So even though Panama is a kind of tiny country, it is geologically quite uh, special because it, it marks the boundary between the two oceans. So uh, the reason why we've got a piece of land right there in between the Americas is related indirectly to plate tectonics and volcanism. So if we uh, show on top of the view of the earth here, some uh, boundaries between different uh, tectonic plates, we can see that Panama is actually surrounded by a series of important tectonic limits. And one of these limits that is running all the way along Panama here and towards Mexico and uh, towards uh, North America as well as South America for the, for the South is called a subduction zone. And a subduction zone uh, I think is best seen if we just uh, have a look at the Earth uh, in a cross-section view. So here we get another representation of the same Earth, but here we're looking at the cross-section and you see here the southern part of South America and here the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. So it's kind of similar to what we're looking here on the left, except in this case we can see that, well, uh, there is a crust that is shown here in, in white that is forming uh, the South American continent and there is an oceanic plate that is actually going under this continent in what we call a subduction zone. And this subduction process is basically where you get uh, the oceanic crust going under the continent and going back here or going down into the mantle. And this type of uh, process is associated with a range of physical and chemical processes that lead to the formation of magma. And perhaps somewhat ironically, uh, the release of water from the downgoing here oceanic crust is creating a melting, uh, partial melting of the mantle, which otherwise is relatively hot, but mostly solid. Uh, it's rock. And, and this mantle is going to melt to produce magmas, and these magmas uh, can then um, feed some volcanic systems and form volcanoes at the surface of of the Earth. And I'm going to explain a little bit more what is exactly the meaning of this 3D block diagram later in my talk. So actually you can see here that Panama is, is kind of interesting geologically for a range of reasons. It's both geographic reasons and tectonic reasons and volcanic reasons. So uh, another interesting aspect of Panama is, well, Panama has not always formed a land bridge. And uh, the full exposure 
uh, emergence of Panama occurred a few million years ago. We're still not exactly sure when that happened. There is a lot of debate in the scientific community currently, but we know or we suspect that when the full emergence of Panama occurred, it formed the land bridge, it formed the isthmus, and that could have actually promoted the migration of different terrestrial organisms between North and South America. And actually, you know, Panama is in a way a very convenient land bridge that would allow or foster uh, quite extensive migrations between the two continents. And so there's been a series of uh, migration even through geological times. Uh, the latest one between the, the two Americas occurred probably about three million years ago. And this is very often referred to as the great uh, American biotic interchange, which is a, one of the big biological events that has taken place in the past few million years of the history of the earth. And you can learn a lot about actually Actually, these are uh, gabbies called the Great American Biotic Interchange. If you have a chance to go to Panama and visit, for instance, the Museum of Biodiversity. Um, another important reason why uh, Panama is interesting to look at is because, well, as I said earlier, it forms a barrier between the two oceans. And here I'm just going to uh, animate a model by NASA, which is on oceanic currents in both the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. And so what you can see is, well, you get currents, you know, working in the Pacific, and you get some currents working in the Atlantic. And what is important to realize here is that you get a current that is kind of sliding uh, along the northern part of South America and then kind of being deflected in the Caribbean here as it gets closer to the isthmus of Panama. And then it gets deflected and it goes further up. And you can see this current is going all along uh, the eastern coast of North America and then heading towards uh, Western Europe. So that current here is called the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream is kind of important for a range of reasons. One of the, of the reasons is that it brings a lot of um, hot water towards Western Europe and it makes our winters relatively uh, mild, relatively temperate compared to the winters at the same latitude on the other side of the Atlantic. It's because uh, the Gulf Stream is carrying hot water that has warmed up in the Caribbean and that is basically heading towards the north. Um, another way to look at this effect uh, on oceanographic circulation of the Isthmus of Panama is here a general view of the Earth, a map view, where you get these sort of arteries and veins, which are a simple depiction of the different main oceanic currents uh, in the oceans. And you can see here, you get this hot current in red that is being deflected uh, in the Caribbean because of the occurrence of the Isthmus of Panama. If there was no Isthmus of Panama, the current would just go straight uh, in between the Americas into the Pacific. And so then it's, it's this, Gulf, this current, the Gulf Stream uh, goes up to the north, um, you know, gets really close to us in the UK and then reaches the, the north, uh, northern part of the Atlantic. And so that's, that's important not only for what is going on in the Atlantic, but uh, obviously this current is linked to a series of other currents around the earth. And what is important to realize here is that all these oceanic currents are coupled with the climate. So the climate that we have today is uh, intrinsically linked to the oceanic currents and these oceanic currents would not exist without Panama. And therefore, Panama or the formation of Panama had a very big impact on the formation of the modern climate. Without Panama, the climate, as we know it today, would probably be very different. So one of the effects of these hot currents reaching the northern part of the Atlantic uh, is that while well, it's heating up Western Europe, as I was saying, but also it is leading to a lot of evaporation. And because the climate is kind of cold up there, uh, when you get closer to the North Pole, uh, the precipitations, the evaporation and precipitation in that area are leading to an accumulation of snow, especially on Greenland and, and nearby lands. And it's believed actually that this intensification of the current as the Isthmus of Panama was being uh, formed has led to uh, the formation indirectly of an ice cap. And that's the reason why I've put uh, a nice looking uh, 
polar bear here because actually you know the polar bears they, they live on an ice cap and we believe that without the formation of the isthmus of panama they would probably never have been the formation of an ice cap because well uh, the climate would have been quite different uh, so the big question that uh, a lot of scientists in different disciplines are trying to address today is that uh, we, we're not really sure about the timing of formation of the isthmus. And there are different ways to address the problem. One possible way is uh, just, uh, whoops, sorry about this, getting slightly out of control here. Yeah, so one possible way um, to, to uh, actually look at uh, when the isthmus has formed is to look at the record of small fossils in the oceans, micro fossils, and you can uh, date their or you can analyze their composition and then their composition is going to give you an indirect constraint on the temperature at the bottom of the oceans. And what we can see if we look at some of these micro fossils in the Caribbean and nearby Atlantic close to, to Panama, we can see actually that the composition here, it's, uh, it's called actually uh, 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 oxygen 18, it's a particular isotope of oxygen, uh, which we use to calculate all past temperatures in the oceans. We can see actually there is a big change in, in the composition in uh, 18 oxygen and the temperature about 3 million years ago. We can date all the fossils that have deposited at different times and we see a change in paleo temperature patterns in the Caribbean and Atlantic Ocean close to, to Panama, and that occurred about 3 million years ago. And so that's the reason why originally, since the 90s, people have assumed that the isthmus formed about 3 million years ago and led uh, to a range of uh, changes in the oceans and in the climate. That uh, idea has been challenged recently in 2015. Some people uh, use a different approach. They were looking at some uh, tiny volcanic minerals, which we called zircons, that are produced in magmas as the magma crystallizes, so in volcanoes. And then these volcanoes can be eroded and uh, the zircons are going to be transported in uh, the erosional products of these volcanoes, so in the sediments, and they're going to accumulate in some places and then well, in sedimentary deposits, and then we can look at these zircons uh, in the sedimentary deposits through time and look at their age, and we can reconstruct uh, the age uh, of the volcanoes in which they form. And making a series of assumptions, we can determine where the zircons are coming from. And so this study, which was published a few years ago uh, uh, in one of the prestigious uh, scientific journals, I think in this case it was science, uh, well, su suggests that uh, the uh, Panama actually uh, formed relatively earlier, well, before the three million year uh, age that was assumed based on the, on the micro fossils, uh, because, well, they, that study found some zircons that are believed to come from the erosion of Panama, but these zircons were deposited about 50 million years ago. So suggesting that Panama had already kind of collided here of a uh, duct with uh, South America at, at uh, this time. And so this idea is actually related to, uh, to the tectonic evolution of the Isthmus of Panama. Uh, most people consider that Panama was uh, formed progressively through time and only recently uh, has actually totally connected with South America. So you can see here a uh, tectonic reconstruction or a paleogeographic or a geographic reconstruction, if you like, through time of the isthmus. You can see that the isthmus was here not fully formed about 20 million years ago. And then with time, uh, about 12, 12 million years ago, possibly was starting to, uh, to, to be to being connected until relatively recently, where it's, it's almost entirely completed. So uh, the bottom line of these different models is that they don't all agree on the exact timing of formation of the isthmus. And also they have a, a common character, which is that they all use relatively indirect constraints to reconstruct the geographic evolution of the isthmus. So 
The key problem here is how to better determine the geographic evolution of Panama through time. And so the approach of uh, my research group and, and several of my collaborators in, in the world has been to more systematically explore and directly constrain the geology of the isthmus at the scale of the isthmus. So uh, as a researcher, I consider myself as a field geology. So I, I spent a lot of time uh, of in the past 20 years or so, uh, just walking around in Panama trying to find clues about the emergence of the isthmus through time. So this is actually a very, very challenging task. It's, it's a lot of fun to do, but it's very challenging because most of Panama and nearby countries are covered with very dense uh, vegetation. So this is here a very nice view of the Osa Peninsula in uh, South Costa Rica, very close to Panama. This is here a view in central Panama. And because the, the area is so vegetated, we know still very little, very little about the geology. And also in Panama, uh, there's not been a geological survey to construct geological maps for 20 years. So actually we've been visiting places over the years which have never been looked at before by geologists. And we keep on finding things that are relatively unexpected uh, with the uh, kind of general models that are being currently discussed in the scientific literature. So uh, this is kind of the coverage that we've uh, had in the, in the past uh, 20 years. So I started when I was doing my PhD uh, as a PhD student, but more recently, uh, several uh, people have, have helped us. So some PhD students in Cardiff, but also some colleagues in Panama and Colombia. And a lot of this work has taken place thanks to the National Geographic, which uh, really helped us conduct a very explorative research, which is something that is very difficult to fund uh, currently uh, in academia, uh, but fortunately there are still some organizations like the Ge National Geographic that are willing to take the risk to fund people to go in unexplored place, places just to try to figure out what sort of rocks uh, um, are occurring in different parts of, of the area. So the sort of um, uh, clues that we're trying to find to reconstruct the emergence of Panama through time look a little bit like this. We get here two examples of rocks. Uh, so here, uh, this is an example that's been cut just to show better uh, the structure of the rock. So we have got actually clasts of volcanic rocks that are embedded uh, in uh, of rock material that includes many fossils. We know uh, the rock was deposited in a shallow marine environment, but this rock is a volcanic rock that is rounded. And it's very important because uh, that means that this piece of rock has been transported in a river. So then we can use the fossils of the rock to date uh, that particular sediment deposit. And we know that this sediment uh, was deposited close to an island. So uh, that's actually a very uh, straightforward way to date the emergence of the isthmus. The only challenge is you have to find this sort of rock uh, in the geological record in different parts of Panama. Also, sometimes we get other examples on the emergence of, of the isthmus, uh, like in this case where we have a piece of coral, so it's a particular fossil that has grown on top of some of these rounded uh, clasts or pebbles of volcanic rock. And then we take also some samples uh, to, to do the dating, but also to do some geochemical analysis of the volcanic rocks, because that provides important clues about the volcanic evolution of Panama. So the sort of work we do might, you know, seems like a lot of enjoyment. And I guess a lot of people, when we say, oh, we're going out in the field again to do some some work, they're going to think, oh, it's, it's a bit like this. Uh, but the reality is a bit more like this. Uh, so this is here, a, a friend of mine, uh, we were in doing some field work in Panama about 10 years ago. We had been walking for three or four days in, in the jungle and we were kind of lost at, 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 this, at this time, actually. Our guide was not finding the track that we were supposed to find. Uh, that was still the time where the GPSs were not working really well under the canopy. So we were just actually in the middle of a really big uh, natural park and not really sure about how to find the, the quick, quickest way out. And we're kind of tired, um, but still we're happy because we're finding some uh, interesting rocks uh, on the way. 
Uh, so the, the rest of our field activities, they, they look a little bit like this. So here uh, we've got some colleagues from the uh, University of Panama uh, that were help, helping us recently. So we're just walking along rivers. We look at uh, rocks. So these are really nice looking rocks. Uh, some of the oldest actually of, of Panama that date back to 70 million years ago. And some more recent volcanic rocks that here have just formed big, big boulders that have accumulated in the river. And I was just making our progression harder. The reason why we follow rivers is because the, uh, the river is just removing all, all the soil and a bit, a bit, just a bit, the vegetation. So it, it's very useful for us uh, to access uh, the, the rock uh, record. Uh, I've used sometimes some horses uh, that looks very nice on on a photo. Uh, that's that's lovely, I guess. If you if you like horses, I don't mind horses, but I found that you know if you're not used to ride a horse, uh, it can be that can get quite uh, painful after after a few days. But the advantage of horses is as long as you don't have to cross over the forest, and if you just you know walk along the shores, you can carry a lot of rocks with you. So it's good for sampling. But most of our work more recently has taken place along the shores, especially at low tide, because we can cover a lot of ground, especially in the unmapped, uncharted areas of Panama. So here you get some very nice looking examples when the sea is very calm. So we just, you know, land on the shore, uh, hammer the rocks, uh, get a few samples in the bags, and then we ship them back to uh, Cardi for further analysis. Most of the time it's relatively smooth, so we can just push the boat on the side, uh, especially if the waves are relatively small. Sometimes, unfortunately, the shore is hardly accessible for several tens of kilometers, can be very rocky. Sometimes there are big waves so we're actually to jump in the water and, and swim towards the shore. So we carry waterproof bags, uh, which are stuffed with the hammers that, that we need to use to collect the, the samples, also, you know, other field equipment. And then we can also put a few uh, uh, chunks of rocks about this size in the bags, and we can use them as sort of uh, uh, buoyant devices to make our way back to, uh, to the boat. Uh, and yes, uh, we, we use the range of accommodations. Uh, when we stay close to Panama City in central Panama, uh, we might stay in kind of, you know, luxurious hotels. Most of the time we stay in small houses of, of this type. And sometimes we go in further, uh, well, more remote areas. And so here is an example of a shelter by some indigenous communities. So just a platform with a roof. Uh, and you can, uh, you know, just sleep on, on the boards here. It's, it's kind of convenient. It protects you a little bit from the ants, not so much from the mosquitoes, but, uh, you know, at least it's kind of safe. And there is a roof, which is great when it rains. You know, Panama is fairly rainy. And that's more like the extreme version, uh, which we try to avoid nowadays, at least uh, me as I'm getting older. But uh, I, I use actually to walk for several days with uh, guides in the forest, through the forest, along rivers, um, across mountains, just carrying everything. So food and equipment to sleep, so tents, uh, hammock. And the strategy in this sort of situation is just to uh, eat the rice that we're carrying and we try to replace the weight with rocks, but we always end up having uh, a lot of rocks to, to carry around, which is why it's good to have uh, uh, some strong guides uh, doing the work with us. Uh, yeah, we do some mapping in the field. So we've mapped a few islands. So here is an example from the Pearl Islands that, that we made recently uh, with, with a colleague of, of mine in, in Panama over the past few years. Uh, and then eventually we, we get all the samples back uh, to the lab in Cardiff where we do uh, different sorts of analysis, uh, uh, in particular geochemical work. So all these work has, has led us to, through the years, to develop a series of models on the evolution of the isthmus. And so here you can see a model. I don't have so much time to explain this in, in detail, so I'm sorry, but perhaps you can ask a few questions. But yes, we've, we've actually uh, reconstructed the, uh, the timing of the first emergence of the volcanoes through time. And this is still a model in, in, uh, in progress. Uh, so we are actually still working on making this model better. But uh, early on during my PhD thesis, I thought that there might be some subaerial volcanoes already uh, in the late Cretaceous about 70 million years ago. So, you know, 
way earlier than uh, the 3 million years that was originally thought to be the age of formation of the isthmus. So this is actually something that is being confirmed uh, as I speak today. We've, we're have still getting uh, new data, especially in the past couple of years, which is uh, uh, confirming that there, there's been an early emergence of, of Panama. We've done similar reconstructions of evolution of volcanoes at a much uh, smaller scale over much shorter time scales as well. Uh, when we've been working with the Panama Canal in central Panama between uh, an age range that was between roughly 21 million years ago and 18 million years ago. And we were just looking at the rocks in the field and, and dating them and looking at the geochemistry to reconstruct uh, the evolution of ancient volcanoes that have formed in that area. And what we found is that we had both submarine and subaerial volcanoes. So volcanoes that were both forming underwater and volcanoes that were forming uh, uh, on land. So that was really showing us that the, the isthmus was still being formed at the time and that we had a very complex range of environments in central Panama. And then uh, we've also uh, used more remote geological constraints. So here is an example from some rocks that we found in the Western Cordillera of Colombia. And uh, so all these red rocks here, uh, we've characterized them in detail. And we found actually some of these rocks are volcanic deposits that are associated with the emergence of very, very old volcanoes. Uh, we think they are 90 million years uh, old. And we think that these volcanoes uh, formed during, well, the emergence of the volcanic basement of uh, the more recent Panamanian volcanoes. And this volcanic basement is also forming most of what we find in the Caribbean. It's called an oceanic plateau. It's a particular type of volcano that's very big and forms in the ocean. And what we found in, in Colombia is that this volcanic basement is actually, was actually already quite shallow about 90 million years ago. So this is, again, a very interesting observation that is suggesting that the isthmus of Panama has probably formed a long time ago. And therefore, our ongoing research is uh, questioning the validity of several uh, models on the formation of the isthmus. So our work is, is very scientifically oriented, but we also have had uh, an opportunity, the chance, to work with some uh, industrial collaborators, industry uh, in Panama, like the Panama Canal Authority, where our work on the volcanic evolution of the canal area has helped uh, the Panama Canal Authority better understand what was the geology in the environment here. And also, well, you can see there, there's some work, uh, that's the Panama Canal, there is some work here being done to actually control the slopes and in particular the slope stability to make sure that you don't have big landslides taking place. Here is an example from the 80s. It was a big landslide that disrupted the Panama Canal, which, which was a big problem. It has big financial impact. Um, so what we showed is that there is a link between uh, the different phases of volcanic evolution of that area and the slope stability along the canal. And only some sort of volcanoes have formed clay-rich geological deposits that are prone to creating a lot of landslides. So this is very exciting. We also have some collaborations with the mining industry in a few places and universities and we're hoping to develop uh, collaborative teaching in the future using some of the outputs of our research. So I think that's all I wanted to say. It's kind of a taster of what we're doing. If you want to learn more about our project, uh, I encourage you to have a look at this website. Uh, I try to, we try to update this as, as uh, often as possible. Uh, if you want also to ask more about the ISMUS or are interested in our project in general, you can always drop me an email. And so, uh, if you've got some questions now, I would be very happy uh, to take them. So please, if you could uh, use the, the Q&A option. And I think that then I could uh, try to address them. So let me go back to uh, the Q&A panel. All right. So thanks all for your attention. Um, yes, yeah, still no question.
still no question coming through. Okay, so well, okay, right. There is there is a question that came through by uh, Ed Size. Thanks, Ed. Uh, yeah, there, there is a difference between the formation of the isthmus and the age when it becomes an ocean barrier land bridge. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think actually a lot of the ongoing scientific debate that is taking place about the exact timing of the formation of the isthmus is kind of um, being impacted by a lack of clarity on what is the actual isthmus and what is Panama. It's very likely that Panama has always been, from very early on, from the for the past 75 million years, I believe at least, uh, has been a chain of islands, a little bit like the Antilles. So if you look at the other side of the Caribbean, in the eastern side, you've got the Antilles where you get a chain of volcanoes and a lot of these volcanoes are, uh, you know, forming islands. And it's very likely that Panama has always been something very similar, but it's only recently, probably in the past, you know, three to 15 million years that it has been fully emerged, has been fully uplifted. And there are different reasons why that happened. It's possible that there's been some tectonic effects, perhaps the collision of Panama with uh, South America has led to a general uplift of the whole area. Uh, so it could form an isthmus, a continuous land bridge between the two Americas. Uh, another possibility that uh, uh, I and my group are trying to push forward is that uh, Panama has always been, until relatively recently, a very active uh, volcanic area. Uh, although there are not many active volcanoes in Panama today, in the past there were a lot of very active volcanoes. And like uh, all volcanically active areas, uh, well, you know, you get mountains, volcanic mountains, volcanoes that are uh, basically always growing. And so if you have something that is always growing, you would expect uh, that Panama is going to become increasingly subaerial through time until forming eventually a land bridge. So that's why it's very important to look at the geological record because we want to understand what is the tectonic contribution and the volcanic contribution to the emergence of Panama. And if you don't look at as many rocks as possible all along Panama, it's actually very difficult to reconstruct. An interesting question here. How do you see uh, the evolution of the isthmus expand or sink, emerge more? This is a very good question. I've never really thought about this. That's a very good question. I, I don't know. That's, that's, the, that's the simple answer. I, I think Panama is going to remain uh, subaerial for a, a bit of time. Um, you know, in the lowermost part of Panama, uh, there, there, are, there are places where, um, where, I can try to share my screen, where uh, the land is fairly low. Uh, let me go through this. I'm trying to get some things through here. Yeah, just, okay. So here we go. So, so here is actually the, yeah, I just can't get this uh, through, sorry. I'm going to try to share my screen again. I'm going to share everything. Okay, so now it should work. So, right, hopefully you can see my whole screen. So this is a topography of Panama today. And so the lowermost part of Panama is where obviously they constructed the canal. It would have been a bit silly to construct uh, a canal through big mountains. And so here the topography is, is not very high. You get a few hills that are a few tens to a hundred of meters high. So I think if the isthmus was going to disappear, it would probably be the first place where the sea is going to invade the land and again, form a connection between the Caribbean and the Pacific. But I, I think the Panama is actually tectonically quite stable nowadays. And so I don't think that Panama is going to disappear uh, before a few million years. The reason why I say it might disappear is because for uh, all that area in, in Eastern Panama and including Central Panama, where you get the Panama Canal and Panama City, there is no active volcanic uh, volcanoes. 
Uh, and so the, the lack of activity of active volcanoes mean that most of the time here, you're removing materials for erosion rather than adding material because of volcanic activity. So uh, I, I think Panama is very likely going to disappear, but it's probably going to take a few million years. Uh, another question is about uh, the oxygen uh, 18. So how does that uh, record suggest that the ocean currents stopped gradually? So uh, actually it doesn't necessarily show that the, the oceanic current stopped. It's more like uh, the, uh, the current and especially the Gulf Stream got intensified. And that's because, I'm sure I didn't explain this really well. I'm just going to come back to my previous slide here. Okay, so, and that's, that's because if you have a passage between the two Americas here, uh, all that hot water that is going through the Caribbean is going to mostly flow through uh, the, the gateway and into the Pacific. But if you've got a, a closure of the connection, that's hot water is still going to stay around, it is going to get hotter. And so this current is, the strength of this current here, it's probably going to, to get intensified. So the hot water is going to float to buy on the surface of the ocean, and then it cools down here and then it goes back. And you get this kind of current, big conveyor belt that is, as, as it is sometimes uh, uh, called. So I hope I've addressed the, the question. Uh, if it's not clear, just make sure you can, you know, uh, send another question. Another question by uh, Ed is, I'm aware also that there are big differences in tidal range on either side of the isthmus. Would this always have been the case? Um, we don't know. I think we don't know. And I think I, we've looked at this problem recently because we were interested in the emergence of uh, the eastern part of Panama. So if I come back here, I don't know if I've got a small, I don't think I've got that information right here, unfortunately. But yeah, so uh, in all this part of Panama, there are very shallow seas, uh, you know, a few tens of meters deep to 100 meters, for whole, that whole area here, which is quite big, several hundred kilometers wide. Uh, and we've been looking at the evolution of tides through time, whether there, there's been any uh, studies, but there is very limited information on, on this, um, unfortunately. Um, yeah, there is a question in Spanish. Uh, I'm going to read it in Spanish and then translate if I can. ¿Cuáles serían las herramientas geológicas de estudio para evaluar el registro volcánico y realizar la reconstrucción? So what are the geological tools you can use to study uh, the volcanic record and uh, reconstruct the evolution of the volcanoes. So it's mostly field observations. We can recognize different types of volcanic activity by looking uh, at, the, at the rock uh, deposits, but also we can use the geochemistry of the rocks themselves to uh, understand what sort of magmatic activity we had uh, with, the, uh, with the volcanoes. So I hope uh, it's, it's sufficiently clear. Lo siento, no tengo tiempo para hacer la traducción en castellano. I'm really sorry, I can't really translate this in, in Spanish. Uh, are all the volcanics related to subduction processes or are the older ones of a different origin? Yes, fair question. The older ones that are related to the oceanic plateau are actually not related to subduction processes. They are related to intraplate volcanic activity. So a little bit like uh, the volcanoes that you have in Hawaii or in the Galapagos Islands, where you get hot mantle rising in some uh, restricted areas in the ocean, and that is leading to another type of magmatic activity that we call hotspot uh, volcanism. So uh, it's a bit more technical, but I think the, the question was a little bit more technical. Uh, yet another question. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for the comment on, on the talk. Uh, what kind of analysis do you use at the lab to reconstruct the geologic evolution of volcanic rocks? So yes, we use a uh, geochemical analysis. Uh, if you know a little bit about this, so we use whole rock geochemistry. So we just look at the major and trace element contents, but also we use an SEM. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a scanning electron microscope and that, that allows us to look at very small structures, but also to analyze uh, we can use this to analyze the composition of specific minerals uh, in the rock. So we really use a, a range of, of uh, techniques. 
for our work with the Panama Canal, we've also used XRD, which has helped us identify the clay minerals in the volcanic products to see whether the volcanic products had been uh, altered a lot and whether there was a they were associated with a high clay content because when you get a lot of clay in the rocks, uh, then uh, you tend to have uh, landslides, unfortunately. So this we use really a very broad range of techniques. And of course, I didn't say, but we use a microscope. We've got thin slices of, of rocks, which we call thin sections. And that allows us to look at the uh, micro microscopic structures in the rocks. So we can look, for instance, for micro fossils associated with some, uh, uh, some volcanic deposits. We can use this to reconstruct the environments that are associated with some of the volcanic deposits. And Finally, the last question, um, are there any other regions in the world which have such a significant or co comparable influence on the modern global climate? I don't think so. Uh, I think Panama is really special uh, in the past you know, 20 million years. Uh, oh, at, at deeper geological time scales, yes, of course, the formation of the Himalayas has probably played a role in the formation of the monsoon, uh, which is a big also a, a climate, uh, climatic feature that is uh, uh, affecting indirectly the, the world climate, but obviously mostly taking place in Asia. Um, yeah, there might be a few other like nearby examples. If you take, for instance, the evolution of the Mediterranean, there's been obviously the evolution of the uh, Gibraltar Strait, uh, which has had a, a big impact. At some point, uh, the Mediterranean Sea was almost entirely dried, and that has led to the formation of uh, salt deposits, notably, but that was also affecting local climate. Uh, uh, in a way, I think, you know, Panama is not so exceptional if you look at the very long uh, evolution of the Earth. But um, in geological time scales, over the past 10 million years, I think Panama was pretty uh, important and, and pretty exceptional, which is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm still very motivated to uh, keep in on developing new research ideas in, in the area because I think that has a really uh, interesting potential to tackle a, a range of uh, broader uh, problems. And uh, there is still one last question that just came through. Are there still unanswered questions regarding the evolution of Panama? Yes, uh, there are many questions. Um, uh, some of them are a bit more technical, I, I guess. Uh, the, the one that is interesting because it has some practical implications is if you go to, uh, to this part of Panama here, uh, there is actually a very big copper mine and it's, it's one of the, the largest copper mines in the world. Uh, copper is really important to mine um, because we use it in all our you know, electronic devices. Uh, we couldn't have that Zoom session if we were not mining copper somewhere in the world because all the computers, they, they use a lot of copper. It's important for many uh, products. Uh, so what is bizarre actually is copper is normally not uh, found uh, to this level of abundance in the sort of tectonic setting associated with the Isthmus of Panama. And at this stage, we don't understand why there is so much copper in Panama. So I think this is one of the interesting questions that we would like to address in the future, because uh, better understanding why there are big uh, copper resources there could help us understand the volcanic evolution of Panama, but also could help us you know, perhaps better uh, uh, mine the copper in Panama or find new uh, copper sources. And you know, that's a resource that we're going to need to find if we want to keep on uh, developing our technologies. Uh, still have a few questions. Uh, yeah, um, I'm happy to, to, to keep on going at least until six, but then I think we'll have to, to close this. So thanks for all that are still around and asking questions. Um, so a question by Milton, uh, so it might be Milton from Colombia. Hi Milton. Uh, what could be the tectonic and structural implications between having emerged volcanic rocks uh, and volcanism instead of having underwater volcanic rocks and submarine volcanism at the time of accretion? How to differentiate ancient volcanic sedimentary rocks as lahar products from typical ancient sedimentary rocks? Um, so. Milton, if, you, if you're the Milton I'm, I'm thinking about, I really believe we could have a very technical discussion about this. I'm happy to chat about this uh, anytime. Send me an email. Um, 
I think I've sort of indirectly addressed that question uh, already. We, we just look at the, the characteristics of, of the deposits to determine whether they are submarine or subaerial and whether they are associated with direct volcanic activity. Uh, you have an eruption formation of products that are deposited in an environment, or sometimes you have volcanoes that are formed and become dormant, and then they are eroded and that leads to another type of uh, uh, deposit. So we can really di differentiate between all these things uh, with, with a good geological uh, eyes. And, and then, um, I'm not really sure about the tectonic and structural implications between having emerged or submerged volcanic rocks when it comes to the collision between Panama and, uh, and uh, South America. I think, frankly, uh, most of Panama was probably already emergent at the time when you have uh, a phase of collision between Panama and South America. So in a way, I think a lot of the debate that has taken place in some of the prestigious uh, journals in the past few years are kind of not really taken into consideration the, the volcanic growth of Panama, which in my opinion is a, an important feature. Um, and a, a question by uh, BMW, the land masses of North and South America uh, is the distance between them changing? Uh, uh, is the Caribbean uh, getting wider or closing up? It's a very good question. Uh, there are some very good reconstruction of the relative position between North and South America through time. So at first, North and South America got separated uh, probably about 150 million years ago. Very quickly, they got separated as you start also opening the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and as uh, North and South America has been progressively detaching themselves from Europe and, and Africa, and, and uh, but since then, probably for the past 100 million years, the distance has remained relatively similar between uh, North and South America. So then uh, what really matters is, is when do you form uh, the volcanic chains of the Antilles and Panama, and especially Panama and when it becomes emergent. But that's, that's a good question. And then uh, finally, uh, was the land bridge much wider originally or has it been eroded? Uh, I think it's been very, very dynamic. I think uh, at, at times local areas of the isthmus were really wide. They were forming perhaps big islands. Sometimes uh, the, uh, perhaps you had just tiny islands that were separated by a lot of water. Uh, it's just really, really difficult to figure this out because it's very hard to find a lot of good places in Panama where you have a very good record through time of, you know, the evolution in one particular place. Um, very often we just find a, a few crappy outcrops, a few fresh rocks in the middle of nowhere and all is covered with, with trees. So. Um, even after doing this for almost 20 years now, uh, I, I still believe our understanding is, uh, is quite limited by uh, the limited access to, to the rocks. But, you know, we're trying our best and, and we are finding new localities which are really interesting. But I think the actual detail of the evolution of Panama and all the islands that formed and disappeared through time it's probably going to remain always a little bit out of reach. But, you know, we can, we can do our best as field geologists and try to reconstruct things as best as we can. So, so that's it, I think, for all the, the questions. Uh, thanks a lot for, for all these questions, for your interest. It was a pleasure uh, to, to give this talk today. And so as your host today, it's also uh, my duty to remember, uh, to to to, to mention again that uh, the geotalks are going to take place until mid-November and next week is going to be uh, my pleasure uh, to have Niall Groom talking about the evolution of North Wales. So we're going to look at slightly similar rocks but a totally different geological context with uh, different implications. Uh, until then, uh, I wish you a, a very good uh, evening and I hope to see you all uh, next week. Thanks all. Goodbye.